joining you for Erica's talk uh, on Wednesday as well, which sounds uh, fascinating. So, yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you today. I'm, I'm just sorry that I can't be there um, in person. Um, so what I want to do with this paper today is basically to keep it quite informal. Um, I don't want to try and read out a nicely <laughs> well-written, detailed, close study paper. I want to kind of talk through some of the key trends and developments that I, I'm, I'm seeing and, and the material that I'm, I'm working with. Um, I also want to make a, a quick <laughs> um, warning that we may at some point be Zoom bombed by my cats who like to make an appearance on these things. So apologies if a tail suddenly goes <laughs> in front of my face at any point. Uh, it's almost bound to happen. Uh, so, but yeah, thank you very much for, for having me on today. So, so let's get started. All right. Um, okay. So what I want to do with this paper today is basically I want to propose what I'm calling an age initial and a generationalized analysis of conflict focusing today on colonial insurgencies. Now, children were very much um, some of the key victims of, of colonial counterinsurgency tactics and the liberation struggles that emerged in the decolonization era. They were um, displaced, they were beaten, they were maimed, they were killed. However, not all children were victims uh, in these conflicts. Some of them were fully agential, some of them were partially agential, and many of them joined in the liberation struggles. Now we see that we have a quote here from George Grievous where he says, I know of no other movement, organization or army which has so actively employed boys and girls of school age in the front line. And yet there is every reason to do so. Young people love danger. They must take risks to prove their worth. And indeed, youth were very much to the fore of the struggle um, in Cyprus. And when that broke out, colonial authorities were, were shocked to find that there were children on the front line doing everything from leafleting, to throwing stones, to protesting, to being involved in bombings and shootings. So the question is why? were these youths there. Colonial authorities, as you can see from the second quote, you know, they very much saw these children as being coerced, as co-opted, as corrupted um, by these kind of liberation groups. However, we could contest that. We will think about the reasons why children become involved in conflict, why youths join these liberation struggles. So that's really what I want to do with this paper uh, today to explore some of these ideas. Now, as Marcus mentioned, this is sort of based on a, a, some work that's been published in Comparative Studies for Society and History. And that article came out of a series of, of the Labour Human Research Network that we had with Professor Martin Thomas at Exeter that was discussing colonial insurgencies and counterinsurgencies. And basically, I've been reading Kilcullen and looking at this kind of maxim that he has of modern counterinsurgency being very much uh, based on core principles of engaging the women but be wearing the children. I was thinking to myself, okay, but when do security forces decide they need to be beware of children? And this coincided with Patricia Owens giving me a paper um, where she was talking about her, her analysis of the household as being a key unit of colonial counterinsurgency. And so I was thinking, okay, households, you know, they're, you know, we talk about the kind of gender dynamics of that, but actually households are very much generational units as well. So where's the generational analysis in this? Because if we look at a lot of literature around um, conflict and insurgency in particular, we can look at the way that it analyzes class, religion, race, ethnicity, ideology, and more recently we've seen a turn towards looking at gender, particularly driven by kind of feminist IR scholarship. But what seems to me to be an odd gap in the literature is age. So the argument that I want to make today is that children and youth play significant roles in colonial insurgency, anti-colonial insurgencies and colonial counterinsurgency. So what I'm arguing for is this kind of age initial analysis as I'm calling it. It's a bit bit twee, but you know, <laughs> couldn't find a better way of describing it. Where I want to focus on the role of age and the significance of children and youth in these conflicts. And also to focus very much on trying to understand the relative agency of youth within these struggles. And I'd make the point that, you know, there is, there is this gap in the literature because we look at the way that patriarchal structures of power have shaped colonial archives. And if we look at the way that youth rebellions have been co-opted and then abandoned by successful um, liberation governments subsequently, we see that there, there are 
um, contributions have very much been underestimated in the existing historiography. I want to make a wider point as well um, to suggest that perhaps we could think about more about the way that age and generation can be very powerful as lenses for analyses of conflict. So that's why I want to make this point about the need for trying to generationalize insurgency and counterinsurgency. I've written elsewhere about the need to actually gender nationalize and to particularly look at the intersections between gender uh, and generation and conflict, but I'll, I'll leave that to the side um, for now. So within this argument about the significance of children and youth in, in colonial uh, counterinsurgency and anti-colonial liberation struggles, I've got a few key points that I really want to make. So one is that youth insurgency is not something that is anticipated um, by colonial forces, but it does tend to emerge actually quite early on in most liberation struggles. When we find the emergence of this kind of what's called juvenile insurgency or juvenile terrorism, it tends to be responded to through the lenses of delinquency rather than just securitization. So it means that often what we're looking at is not just military responses, but actually welfaristic responses as well. I don't find any coordinated trans or imperial response or any kind of comparative discussion in the work that I'm doing looking at British, French, and a little bit of Portuguese um, case studies on this. But even though there's no coordinated response or general discussion, you do see commonalities emerge in the way that colonial states respond to the presence of youth and insurgencies. And that's because they tend to focus on ideas of rehabilitation, which are based on pre-existing juvenile reform technologies. So there are kind of commonalities that make it really uh, interesting to do some comparative analysis. I would also say that children and youth are very much key targets of hearts and minds, the kind of classic population-centered counterinsurgency, but there is a failure to really understand uh, insurgent youth and their grievances that inhibits colonial responses. And the final point that I'd like to make is that youth liminality is really key to understanding child and youth soldiering um, in this period, and I'll talk more about that later. So as Mark mentioned, this, uh, what I'm talking about today is really coming out of this broader work that I'm doing on the history of child soldiering in Africa from the late 19th up to the 21st century, which looks at both kind of um, histories of conflict, but also histories of humanitarian responses and a kind of social history of, of, kind of histories of childhood um, approaches as well. So my work's really bringing those three kind of schools of thought together in terms of military history, social history, um, and humanitarian history there. So that sort of inflects the way that I'm approaching this um, project. In terms of the methodology and the evidence base for this project, I'm very much doing kind of qualitative analysis here, mainly due to the fact that of the weakness of the quantitative data it is actually really hard to try and put numbers uh, on the number of children and youth who are involved. Now I'll talk a bit more about that, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to get any kind of concrete figures. In terms of evidence, I'm drawing from across military, police, legal, welfare, administrative and humanitarian archives and combining that with youth coverage, memoirs, photographs and interviews to kind of build the analysis here. I'm talk, I've done a kind of broad comparative analysis between 1945 and kind of 1960, 65 thereabouts um, across British, French and a bit of Portuguese empires as well, drawing a few other examples. But today I'm gonna to talk primarily about Cyprus and Kenya because they do actually offer some interesting points of comparison. You know, they're both happening at a very similar time, late fifties, they've both like kind of urban rural dynamics, but they allow us to kind of explore the impact of race and different ideas of childhood and youth, which can you know, shape responses. I'm also very much talking about adult perceptions of children today. There are very few kind of direct youth voices that we can find in the archive room, and I haven't been able to do as much interviews as I'd like. Um, so it's very much looking at kind of adult perceptions. Another point to note is that the term child soldier actually really only emerges after 1987. So it's quite historical. So instead what I've been doing is tracing um, terms like child, juvenile, young person, youth, boy, girl, student, or, or jeunesse, or even kind of local terms like pomuda or kadogo um, through the archive. So really what I'm primarily focusing on here are what Manon Pino calls this ado combatant, the teenage fighters, adolescent fighters really. 
And to do this, I'm using what we call relational analysis and, and sort of sociologists of childhood, looking at the relationships between generational structures, discourses surrounding childhood and youth, and the kind of life experiences of, of individual um, youth themselves. Now, my work in general takes this term child soldiering, but I'm not using that today, and there's a, there's a reason for that. And it's partly to do with this tension between local and global and universalist and more constructivist notions of childhood under which we understand that children is actually historically and culturally contingent. Now, the current UN definition of a child soldier is anyone under the age of 18 in an armed force or armed group in any capacity. So it's quite broad. But what I'm talking about today is particularly youth soldiers and insurgents. And I've expanded that category a little bit to really look at those roughly between the age of 12 and 20 who are in direct and auxiliary roles and those who are formal members of these groups, but also those who are participating in anti-colonial action and anti-colonial violence where we're not certain whether or not they are a formal member of a group. And the reason for this is just due to um, the limitations of the data in terms of unknown chronological biological ages, people aging out of that category during a conflict and very limited membership data. It's also linked to the way that youth acts as a shifter category uh, and because of this notion of liminality that I want to explore this line between child and adult combat and civilian. But primarily it's because historical actors themselves self-identify as youth rather than children. So I've kind of respected the terminology that they, they have adopted. So there are three sections I want to kind of talk through um, today. So first I want to talk, begin by talking about the emergence of the youth soldier as a category of concern. Um, then I want to move to talk about the logics of youth soldiering. So moving from the whys to the hows, uh, how, how children are involved in these conflicts. And then thirdly, I want to talk about colonial counterinsurgency responses um, to this. So three sections and we're gonna run through them all uh, in a relatively kind of general um, way. So let's get cracking then. So section one, the emergence of the youth and child soldier. Now, when the child soldier first erupts onto the international humanitarian stage, it's in the early 1990s. And child soldiers at this point become these kind of key objects of humanitarian concern. They are focused on human rights abuses, and they become these kind of icons of new wars, these kind of new barbarism theories. And in a way, the kind of core report that really sets up is the Grass and Michelle uh, report for the UN in 1996, in which she constructs child soldiering as, quote, a result of the desolate moral vacuum, a space devoid of the most basic human values. And basically the kind of humanitarian constructions of child soldiering set up this contrast between the kind of new wars in which they see children being involved and the so-called traditional warfare and liberation struggles, which Michelle report posits respect civilian and military boundaries and do not involve children um, in these conflicts. However, if you look at the development of international humanitarian law and the laws of war, a slightly different story emerges. Here, children youth emerge, um, and really the first time that they're tackled in IHL is around the um, additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions in the early 1970s. And if you look at the diplomatic negotiations around this, it's very clear, and this comes through directly from the ICRC records, that they see a real um, emergence of children being involved in conflict at this point, and they see it as a product of the use of, sorry, they see it as a product of, quote, national liberation struggles with a legitimate defense or of guerrilla warfare. Okay, so when the child soldier first really emerges uh, onto this kind of international humanitarian scene, it's because of these anti-colonial liberation struggles. And you can see this in the debate. So you can see the way here that you know, there is this push towards having this kind of straight 18 position where anyone under the age of 18 should not be allowed to be involved in conflict directly or indirectly. But opposition to that comes from a lot of um, countries that had been either were either domestically recruiting children or had recently been involved in anti-colonial liberation struggles. So we see here Greece, Britain and Vietnam putting forward the opinion that 15 to 18 year olds, quote, have the mental and physical capacity to fight and will wish to serve their country in the time of need, okay? Well, that's, as a sense, we can see here that children are very clearly recognized as being involved in anti-colonial liberation struggles. We now have to move from the International Humanitarian Archive to the Colonial Archive to try to understand why 
they become involved in these anticholinal surges and to what extent they are really involved. So in terms of the work that I've been doing, there are a couple of kind of core theories that we could look at as to why children have become involved. Things like youth bulge, demographic theories, patterns of child labor. The jury's still out on those. I need to do a lot more research around um, those kind of theories. So what I want to talk a little bit today is more about the kind of social history side of things and looking at the way that actually the children's involvement in anti-colonial strategies is in a way a product a legacy of colonial norms of childhood and of colonial state strategies of youth politicization, because that's in a way very much the paradox of the colonial state, that in trying to create children and youth as these modern disciplined colonial subjects, the colonial state actually creates new generational identities and historical infrastructure that actually ends up spreading nationalism, youth mobilization, and then insurgency. So if we look at the way that scouts, clubs, youth clubs, schools all become imbricated in these kind of um, nationalist and insurgent movements. It's also in some cases very much a product of World War II in and of itself. Um, you know, we, we actually, there's evidence suggesting that colonial armed forces themselves deploy teenage boy, boys in World War II. We see senior military commanders like uh, George Grieva saying that one of the reasons he recruits children into the um, liberation struggle with Cyprus is because he worked so well with child partisans in Greece during the war. We can see sort of direct legacies from the war to mobilization and militarization of youth in conflicts in Palestine, Indonesia, Malaya, uh, and Indochina as well. And interestingly, in Malaya, the colonial authorities there very openly state that they, they see one of the reasons why there's so many youth becoming involved um, in the, the communist insurgency is because of the loss of education and the loss of parental authority during the Japanese occupation in the war. So in some places, there is this link between the Second World War and the kind of insurgencies that emerge in the way that children are involved. Now, if we look at colonial explanations for why children and youth are becoming involved in these anti-colonial struggles, they have two main theories. They think it's primarily down to what they see as a breakdown of generational authority and failed parenting. Those are the terms that come up again and again and again in the, in the literature. And they see this as creating a wave of juvenile delinquency in the post-war years that almost automatically becomes terrorism, juvenile terrorism when, when conflict erupts. So we see this in kind of Lewis Leakey's work in Kenya, where he talks about the way that a whole generation has disintegrated. Youth no longer discipline or, or having the discipline or respect in their elders. And they just have this desire for adventure that actually they find in violence and terrorism. And in Cyprus, they have this whole report in 1947 around what they call the corruption of youth. Um, you know, they don't see youth as being kind of inherently criminal or antisocial, but they find that it's a result of a, a complete lack of discipline at a difficult age and being groomed and seduced uh, by yoga. And that's the kind of terminology that they use. I should make a point, say at this point that there is a kind of distinct gender dynamic to this. So there's a lot of securitizing boys and seeing them as potential threats and kind of violent actors. But with girls, there's much more moralizing and much more sexualizing uh, of their, their involvement. So there's a lot of concern around the way that female youth use their sexuality um, to encourage other boys and men to be involved. So they see this as a kind of serious security risk in, in Kenya of, of young teenage girls encouraging their menfolk into subversive activities. Um, you know, Louis Leakey thinks that girls, teenage girls are joining mama out of quote, sheer boredom. Um, and there's a lot of concern about kind of prostitution in Cyprus. You see girls as giving themselves promiscuously uh, to members of, of killer and combat groups. So what we see uh, in the colonial discourse around girls' involvement is it's very much a kind of denial of girls' political agency and rational involvement in liberation struggles. And their actions are instead read as a, a search for excitement and of, of sexual gratification there. So that's the kind of colonial discourse that emerges around youth involvement. But if we try to understand actually why youth themselves are being involved and try to kind of understand the youth grievances, we get a slightly different picture. And here we see it's a kind of, you know, we can really see the emergence of what we might call a moral economy of civil war that hinges on generational as well as ethnic and anti-colonial tensions. In a lot of places post-1945, we see youth struggling with access to education, with unemployment or underemployment, and being forced, in, forced into what Mark Summers calls a period of weight hoot. These are youth who are unable to find a job, get money, get married and become adults in the way that they want because of, of the kind of colonial states and societies. 
So for many, joining an armed struggle actually offers new alternative forms of manhood or, or womanhood where existing pathways are blocked uh, by colonial or elder authorities. It's also stated by a number of youth who are involved in these conflict that they didn't really have any other choice other than being involved. So France Fanon, for example, talks to a 13 and a 15 year old boy who are, um, are being tried for the murder of their, their French classmate. And he asks them like, why did you do this? So this war is not about, about you, you don't have to be involved in it. And they turn around and they say to, to Fanon, but they kill children too. So we have these kind of legitimate youth grievances that are really kind of driving their involvement in these conflicts. And then we have the factor of kind of the deliberate youth recruitment as a kind of military tactic and the way that some groups um, try to capitalize on what they see as youth psychology of the rebelliousness of youth and to kind of really co-opt and to mobilize youth agency. Where we see this most deliberately and most visibly and strategically is actually with Eoka uh, and Cyprus. And Grievous is, you know, repeatedly keeps on saying, above all, I, I concentrated on the young here. Um, a lot of the strategic recruitment, we see it happening through scouts groups, through schools, through churches, through kin and peer networks, through age sets, through Oding and Malma. So there are different ways that youth are kind of brought in through these kind of formal military structures as like a deliberate um, a recruitment tactic. But it's not just the fact that these youth are being co-opted and brought in to these groups, they actually do genuinely, in some cases, join themselves. So we have to address this question of youth agency. Now it's difficult to trace through the archive, we need to kind of read against the grain of these generationalized uh, and racialized hierarchies of power that suffuse the archival texts. But what's quite striking is the way that many youths, um, particularly older teens, very much narrate their experiences in terms of political resistance and agency. And it's much more, they're much more likely to use this kind of focus of kind of political action, political resistance than any other category of child soldier memoir that I've looked at, whether it's World War II or contemporary. And these decolonization ones are very expressly politicized in their, their accounts of the actions. So some of them make claims to being that there's a real full tactical agents, they're in charge, they make decisions, they, they dedicate themselves to the cause, you know, they act as radicalizing agents, they recruit other children. That's not the case for everyone. A lot of cases what we're seeing are children youth who are being co-opted, who are being coerced um, into joining. We're also seeing what Hamwana would call tactical and Drumble would call circumscribed agency, a uh, youth who are who may be unable to escape involvement in the conflict, but who volunteer for some roles and resist others. So we see a sliding scale of agency depending on individual experience and also life stage. It's very different for being a 12 year old to being an 18 year old um, in these struggles as well. Well, another thing that I've been looking at really is I'm trying to understand the different sort of facets of, of youth identity, which really shape the way that they become involved in looking at youth insurgents as a, a cohort, as a kind of group identity, as a, a liberation generation, the way that they see themselves as having this kind of liberational identity um, of understanding this kind of life stage, this kind of rebellious youth uh, approach and understanding the way that they get involved through kinship networks as well. And seeing youth very much as these beings, becomings and having beings and trying to understand the way that their actions have been shaped by the experiences of colonialism and their desires um, for the future here. So this leads us on to section two. Um, where we think about the, the logics of child soldiering. So we talked about the why, let's talk about the how. So in terms of breaking this down, I'm finding three main categories uh, of youth involvement in anti-colonial insurgencies. Firstly, troop fortification. Secondly, teenage liminality. Thirdly, symbolic childhoods. Okay, and it's important to realize that most children will actually and youth will actually move across these different categories. The logics for these overlap, and so many children may act in multiple capacities um, almost at the same time. So it's not that these are kind of distinct and bounded um, categories here. So let's start with the first one troop fortification. So here we're looking at youth soldiering as a, as a kind of force multiplier uh, with an asymmetrical warfare. And basically we're looking at the way that children and youth are, are mobilized as able-bodied recruits and physically capable violence workers, essentially doing the same roles as adults. 
We see this primarily uh, in kind of particularly in peasant political economies and spaces of mass mobilization, for example, in the Malayan emergency. In some cases, we see them being integrated into units with adults. In some places, there are separate units. So if we look into China, we see the kind of youth guerrillas, child pioneers, youth shock brigades, Cyprus, we have peon groups like that. We see them involved in both frontline and also, and I'd say particularly in auxiliary support capacities. There does still tend to be a little sort of informal line drawn around sort of how old you have to be on the front line in an armed capacity. And it's normally around the age of 16 and it's primarily gendered as male. So it's, it's teenage boys who are being sent out with, with guns. Some of these roles can actually replicate peacetime child labor. So if we look at the Mujerida girls in the FLN, um, we see them working as cooks, as washerwomen and as nurses. And, and this is still slightly anecdotal, I'm still doing the work on this, but I, I think that we can see in most cases an increase across conflict duration. So they, they become more influential in this kind of troop fortification role as conflicts move on. And there's a sense from the colonial archive that they think they're seeing ever younger children being called, pulled into anti-colonial forces and that children are being sent into uh, frontline roles earlier with less training as, as conflicts kind of drag on uh, as well. The second category is what I'm calling youth liminality. And here what we're looking at are roles where children are kind of physically capable of, of violence, but where they are being coded um, by insurgent groups in colonial states as quote, a civilian child rather than as combatant adults. So it's, it's taking advantage of that kind of slippage between the child and the adult really. And it's this youth liminality that I think is, it fuels a kind of tactical flexibility that is really important for insurgent success. Primarily what we're talking about here are actually covert and intelligence roles. So we're looking at leafleting, scouting, spying, couriering. Often these roles involve replicating normal childhood behaviours of playing or kind of loitering in the street, um, of running errands, that kind of thing. We also see them more directly involved in sort of violent attacks. Um, both boys and girls are, are involved in bomb attacks. So see, for example, here uh, on the bottom picture, Yasmin Belkassem, um, who, who famously lost both her legs aged 14, uh, bringing a, a bomb to a police station in Algiers. We also see them involved in kind of assassination squads, and particularly in Cyprus, at least tend to be boys rather than girls uh, involved in that with girls kind of running support roles for those kind of activities. And what's quite striking from the colonial archive is in both Kenya and Cyprus, we see a sense from colonial authorities that they think um, insurgent groups are deliberately sending out teenagers to do these kind of assassinations because they are aware that under 18s cannot be executed. So they think that insurgent groups are deliberately exploiting this gap between the youth, kind of the violent capacities of youth and their legal accountability uh, in order to kind of make these kind of targeted assassinations. So with these categories, the kind of troop fortification, youth liminality, these are categories which we see in many other conflicts throughout right? history, um, you know, from you know, kind of um, looking at kind of US civil war through to kind of partisan activity in World War II. The third category I think is slightly different. And I think it's a new development in relation to colonial counterinsurgencies. And that's what I'm calling symbolic childhoods and the way that school children are mobilized um, by these groups. And essentially what we're seeing are school children being involved in, in protests and riots and the way that this becomes an effective guerrilla tactic and the way that it deliberately leverages colonial constructions of childhood against colonial regimes. Um, we see it predominantly in urban and guerrilla conflicts and in groups with international support that have propaganda strategies. So we see it particularly in Ioka, a bit in FLN, but not so much um, in Kenya with, with Mau Mau. And essentially what they're doing is they're sending these children up here to raise the profile of these campaigns and also to inhibit colonial security responses because they're aware that colonial force that you know the British government doesn't want pictures of British soldiers stomping on Cypriot um, school kids on the front page of the Guardian or the International Herald and Tribune. So we see these school children acting as protesters, as rioters, but often also as decoys 
um, to distract and, and to move around security forces. And it's interesting here that, that education really becomes a kind of key battleground um, of these kind of um, insurgent strategies, looking at the way, and in Cyprus, we see that the way that the current state responds by trying to quote, de-Hellenize the curriculum uh, in a way. And we see sort of battle the flags and school closures going on in an attempt to kind of control and defeat these, these insurgent children here. We see a kind of slightly different dimension emerging uh, in Indochina and Vietnam. And here, the, the, there's still this kind of propaganda emphasis on the value of, of children and youth in as these kind of revolutionary fighters, this kind of next generation of revolutionary fighters. But the emphasis here is rather on the, the individual lionization, the kind of martyrology that emerges around particular youth heroes and the way that they become central to the iconography um, of resistance and revolution. Uh, individuals like, uh, please pardon my, my pronunciation here, Li Tu Chong. Um, youths who are, are executed for their, their role in killing French and, and American soldiers there. So this kind, of symbol, this kind of symbolic mobilization of childhood is something that seems to me to be quite a bit new um, in these anti-colonial um, insurgencies. So that brings us on to section three, which is about how colonial states respond um, to the presence of children and these kind of youth insurgents. Now, it's important to remember that these, these youth insurgents are still a minority uh, of children. The primary focus uh, in colonial counterinsurgency on children is still very much focusing on them as children within population-centric counterinsurgency. So it's still very much looking at education and their, their, their kind of treatment within villagization and resettlement programs in the way that, that Moritz Fleisinger has, has recently written about very convincingly for Algeria and Kenya. We're still looking at the way that, that children from infants to youth are, are victims of, of colonial um, counterinsurgent violence, um, both in terms of the mortality rates in these camps, but also in terms of military engagements. But if we do turn to these youthful insurgents, we try to think about the ways that military forces and security forces respond to them. This is something that I want to talk with you about because it's something I need to do a bit more research on. But what I found so far is that we can see uh, an evolution uh, and sort of the response of security forces. We see in the kind of orders and the practice and their kind of engagements, we see a shift from children and juveniles being coded as civilians and not a kind of primary target to them becoming legitimate targets throughout the conflict duration. So for example, we can look at Kenya by the way that by 1954, the security um, special branch designates children a quote, serious security risk and begins allowing the you know, enhanced interrogation of children from the age of 13 onwards. In Algeria, we see by 1957, um, increasing sense that children are being targeted um, in attacks. And we're seeing the emergence of, of separate centres uh, de triage um, and transit um, camps specifically set up for youth detainees there. One quick point just to make here that I'm talking about the way that colonial states respond to insurgent youth. In terms of trying to understand the way that youth are involved in colonial security forces, there are actually far fewer archival traces for youth being involved in colonial security forces. Um, but it is likely that they are, and they're particularly in kind of loyalist um, paramilitary home guard forces. And we do know that there are, there's evidence that some are being flipped and recruited for particularly for kind of intelligence translation or support duty. So we see that particularly in Kenya that they, the colonial state is using some children itself um, response. Really, um, in terms of creating colonial concern uh, around uh, the involvement of, of the youth in insurgencies, where it primarily emerges is in response to children's um, appearance in court. Actually, very early on in love margins, you see increasing numbers of juveniles being charged with emergency offences in the special courts. And in Cyprus, I've counted over 1,073, and David French notes that about, that about a third of all people tried for emergency offences in the special courts were actually high schoolers. In Kenya, in 1955, there were 2,571 juveniles in that one year alone charged with the emergency offences. So it's this kind of legal response that really sort of begins to give us a sense of the scale um, of youth involvement. But the question then becomes, okay, so what do you do with these youth whom you have, the military has captured, they've been sent off, um, 
sent to court to be tried. They've been convicted. Okay, what do we do with them now? Normally, what they would do with juveniles um, is they would send them to prison or they would fine them, bind them over. But you don't want to send them to prison because that just means they could be radicalized further by adults. But you don't want to fine them or bind them over because that system relies on parental authority and the parents paying the fees. But if the parents are the ones who are failing to parent them properly in the first place, that's not going to work. So what do you do? You also can't execute them for their involvement, even if they have been involved in, in assassinations. And in Kenya, there are 151 males and two females who have their death sentences and commuted. And Cyprus, they do actually try to change legislation around the death penalty to allow um, those um, 16 and over to be executed, but London refuses to allow that to happen. But it is notable um, that the nine Cypriots who are executed are all youth in this age of, of 19 to 23. And that is a deliberate and express strategy to try and dissuade youth from being involved in violent insurgency. So there's that kind of mobilization of the death penalty there. But if you can't do, you can't lock them up, you can't find them, you can't execute them, what do you do? Two things they decide to do. Firstly, they try to use corporal punishment. And this becomes distinctly racialized. So in Cyprus, there are 154 juveniles caned under emergency regulations, and this creates a huge uproar. It's seen as being antithetical to, to Greek constructions of childhood and good parenting, and it sort of it ends up being discussed at United Nations and everything. So that creates too much of a backlash that so they have to abandon that. But at the same time, there are over 3,000 young persons being caned for mama related defences in Kenya, and nobody bats an eyelid because caning and corporate punishment is seen as appropriate um, for Africans. In the end, what tends to happen is that a lot of these youth who are, are charged and convicted of emergency offences, they end up in detention camps. So essentially what we see is that they are um, uh, pulled into camps primarily originally alongside adults. So in Cyprus, we see that of the 1,118 males who were in detention in 1957, about 20% of them were under 19. And the ICFC becomes very concerned about these, uh, these youths because of the psychological and moral effect of detention. And they basically think that detention is, is almost equivalent to military service in terms of the trauma and radicalization that it can produce. There are similar concerns that are raised in Kenya about the kind of containment and detention there, where you have about 2,000 boys and about 1,000 girls being detained alongside adults. And there's particular concern there around sort of overcrowding, fear of contagion by hardcore mama, and a, a kind of moral panic around what's called improper sexual relations, where they feel that the boys are being basically being raped and abused uh, in the camps. As a result of this, in the sense that the, they think the youth are kind of stagnating or just being radicalized in these camps, they decide to start establishing rehabilitation programs for youth and setting up um, separate segregated camps um, for youth. And these camps, they very much are based on a combination of colonial understandings of local age relations, um, welfareistic responses, and global technologies of juvenile reform. So they basically tend to kind of mash together kind of English notions of borstals, public schools, and kind of security responses to, um, to, uh, to insurgency. In Cyprus, they don't do a lot of this. Basically, there's a sense that they don't think they can really change the minds of these youths, and they don't have the resources to be able to actually do it properly. But in Kenya, they go all in on it. And there's this real sense of colonial paternalism and the sense that African youth are more malleable and in more need of rehabilitation and reform. So they talk about the way that these boys are reclaimable through school and discipline. Um, one of the officials in charge for owls is he describes the way that hard discipline meted out with sound and flawless justice is the best medicine. Like any African, these boys react very favorably. And in Kenya, they set up one camp in particular, which is called Wamumu. And this becomes the kind of the, the crown jewel of the pipeline in many ways. And it's the one aspect of rehabilitation in the Mama emergency that the Kono State actually thinks works to the extent that any boy that goes through uh, Wamumu comes out with a pardon from governing bearing at the other end. And here, what's very striking is the way that these youth insurgents, these were juvenile terrorists, as they're branded, are reconstructed as delinquent, disobedient, but reclaimable children. 
And what we do at Wamumu is they basically, they combine gakuyu rites uh, of adulthood and circumcision. Uh, they combine it with a very kind of hard carceral disciplinary authority. These are not kind of soft spaces. There's still a lot of violence in them. But they combine it with actually providing education, providing a pathway to adulthood through finding the boys' jobs, through mentoring. They have this kind of combination of generational authority and youth cohort identity, which works very effectively. So Wamomo actually becomes this weird sort of success story of the Mama emergency and the way that it takes these these juvenile terrorists and turns them into respectable and successful proto-adults uh, in a way who many of whom who go on to successful careers and some of them actually end up working for a special branch as well during the emergency. So they go from that terrorist to security uh, worker in the space of, of the emergency. Again, this is all gender. So there's a lot of investment in, in Wamumu and the boys and all kind of constructing them as, as economically productive citizens, girls rehabilitation, very much our moralization on domesticating these girls, uh, of taking these kind of sexualized insurgents and turning them into good mothers and basically teaching them how to wash their babies properly and teaching them domestic skills. And the quote that always stands out to me um, from the archive here is the way that one uh, worker, welfare worker, Mrs. Warren Gash, talks about the way that rehabilitation transforms girls from being sour, unpleasant, and downright ugly to being, quote, really pretty. So apparently rehabilitation can change your looks as well. But there's still the sense that girls are somehow inherently immoral and the colonial authorities still believe that they, you know, they can't really be trusted to solve their problems in a, in a happy and honest way. So to conclude, this gives us a kind of overview of the key trends that we're really looking at in terms of children's uh, involvement in anti-colonial insurgencies and um, colonial responses. The key points I really want to get across with this talk are the way that youth were a significant force in anti-colonial insurgency. Their involvement is driven by kinship, by cohort identities, by life experience, and by their own political agency rather than just adult manipulation. In a way, youth insurgency has been a part a response to colonial states' own constructions of childhood and their attempts to control youth. We see youth insurgents being involved in multiple roles, as troop fortifiers to provide sustained manpower. We see the tactical exploitation of youth liminality, and we see the symbolic mobilization of, ch of children and discourses of childhood innocence against colonial states. We see a number of differences um, in the way that children are and youth are, are deployed as well, which are shaped by the recruitment networks that are used, the nature of the conflict and colonial responses. So in Cyprus, we see this very kind of urbanized, very deliberate, very good tactical recruitment driven by Ioka, working through the church, working through school groups to kind of pool in all different ages of children. And MAMA, we see it much more decentralized, much more uh, a response to kind of local peer networks to clothing strategies. Um, and it's a much more kind of fluid uh, involvement. And what we see in this sort of youth involvement in anti-colonial uh, insurgencies, in a way, and colonial responses, in many ways, this sets a model for the way that child soldiering emerges in the post-colonial era. I would argue that it's colonial, their involvement in anti-colonial insurgencies, it, it lacks the dehumanization and it lacks the deliberate generational inversion that we see in places like Mozambique or Northern Uganda in the post-colonial era. But I do think it very much establishes the logic and the models of recruitment. And we see the same um, combination of voluntary and, co uh, and coerced recruitment of direct and indirect participation where that we see in many kind of post-colonial conflicts. And in some places, I think there's, there's this kind of very direct link between anti-colonial insurgencies and post-colonial developments. If we look at Palestine, if we look at um, Cambodia, Angola, uh, Ireland, places like that, we see these kind of real kind of legacies of these kind of anti-colonial insurgencies for the way that contemporary child soldiering operates. Um, there are these kind of common responses as well. We see juveniles being beaten, being detained, being flagged, but also being re-educated and trained to be economically productive and politically acquiescent colonial subjects. We see them being reconstructed as delinquents rather than terrorists to facilitate their subsequent rehabilitation. 
But overall, the point that I want to make is this is very much preliminary research. This is very much a sketch um, of these trends. And what I would like to, to argue for is the need for more research around children and youth, more comparative research, more research once such things become possible again in, in local district archives, more kind of intensive um, oral history investigations in, in former colonies to really recover and, and analyze the experience of these youth who are willing to risk life and limb to fight for the, the future of their countries and to fight for their own future um, as well. So I'll stop there and I hope you found that interesting. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to your feedback and your help with some of these questions around um, sort of military dimensions of, of what I'm talking about. So thank you very much. All right, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Stacey, um, for that. Um, uh, I guess I'll get us started um, and uh, give a few sort of questions or maybe reflections, and and hopefully that'll give the, the audience a chance to, um, to to gather some questions up. Um, for those of you in the audience, if you do have a question, please put it in the the Q and A, um, or or raise your hand, and, and we'll call upon you. Um, so first of all, Stacey, what I'd say is for 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 preliminary research that was incredibly rich um, and enlightening. Um, so I. I can't imagine what the project's going to look like when you you feel like you're you're at the end. Um, I just I just really impressed with the the range of uh, of what you're doing and, and these questions you're you're looking at. And uh, I was struck too by you know a lot of what you were talking about sort of has resonances with earlier historical periods um, as well in the anti-colonial struggle. Uh, and it made me think a lot about um, early Indian uh, revolutionary nationalist violence in in the 1910s and and, and 20s. Um, and, you know, like uh, the, these young youthful assassins like Kudaram Bose, who's, you know, one of the youngest, if, if not the most young, youngest person ever executed in British India. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you look at the, their sort of explanations for what they're doing, as you said, they, they're not like these co-opted sort of um, hapless victims, that they're very deeply political and politically um, it, it engaged. So I think that's a, it's a really important thing to emphasize, you know, this, this notion that youth can be very, like they can have a political agenda very much um, like um, uh, adults. Um, so I guess in terms of a question I had, um, and I guess this is the question you get when you do any sort of like global history um, project. And it's, it's always this fine balancing act between, you know, drawing these, these really important connections and parallels while also maintaining sort of the particularity of specific context or, or conflicts and you know throughout your talk you you sort of um alluded in some cases to you know different um measures in, in colonial counterinsurgency targeting um the youth and i was just wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit more about this and how specifically racial difference and imperial racial hierarchies perhaps conditioned and and and, and determined uh, specific responses um you know it, it, are the responses you, you use against people in Cyprus going to be very different from um, Kenya, for instance, or, you know, in Ireland, for instance, uh, to what um, extent is, does the culture of the, of the colonized country determine sort of the response to the to the youth um, uh, when their uh, the colonial authorities are, are, are clamping down on this? Um, and uh, I suppose actually the, the other the other question that came to my mind as well, if you, if you let me pose too is um, it, it seems to me that a, a lot of the issues you're talking about are, are extremely timely today when we talk about youth radicalization and, 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 and youth going and joining um, you know, uh, armies around the world or, or armed organizations fighting. And I was just wondering, you know, to what extent are, because you, you talked about some of these um, gurus of counterinsurgency like Kilcullen and others. And I was just wondering like how, uh, how aware are, are people engaged in contemporary de-radicalization programs, these sorts of things, aware of these historical precedents and, and looking to them either for uh, inspiration as to what to do or what not to do? Are they trying to just reinvent the wheel without even you know knowing the wheels have been invented? Because I find that's one interesting thing about contemporary counterinsurgency is it replicates so many tropes from colonial counterinsurgency mid 20th century and even into the 19th century without consciously being aware of it in a lot of ways. Um, so I was just wondering if you could maybe speak to a bit, bit to that. But so I'll leave it there, Stacey, and, and look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Mark. Um, two very large and very important questions to kick us off. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry to skip one of those here. Um, 
So in, in terms of your, your first question, yes, racial hierarchies do condition particular responses. Um, but it, it varies depending on what aspect um, of colonial counterinsurgencies we're looking at, basically, and what actors are, are involved. Basically, um, what I would argue is that we see um, the greatest differences in terms of the violence that can be deliberately inflicted on youth insurgents' bodies without any um, concern being expressed um, officially about this. So we see it particularly uh, around, as I mentioned briefly, that kind of corporal punishment and who can and cannot be flogged um, because it was appropriate, it was entirely appropriate for, for Kenyan youth. There was no concern whatsoever about that being used, um, despite the fact that they are, there are more people being flogged and they're being flogged more heavily. That occurs in Cyprus where there is a huge uproar um, about this. It's also, this is where things get a bit tricky. It also seems um, that there was sort of more embedded violence in the rehabilitation response in Kenya than there was uh, in, in Cyprus. And there, although a lot of the, the youth um, in Cyprus actually ended up in, uh, you know, Tremethia, which we know is a particularly, you know, harsh camp, sometimes called Britain's Belzen. Even that compared to Tawamu, which has this kind of aura of being this wonderful reformist place, even that is that's still incredibly violent in many respects. So there, there is still this kind of um, a difference in the way that that particularly black body youth bodies can be controlled, can be punished, can be uh, have violence inflicted upon them. But that is conditioned and contained by the way that. Um, colonial states engage with these broader international um, juvenile reform technologies um, and the way that actually there are, there are limits on what can be done to, to youth, um, which are not the same as you can do to, to adults. So I think youth are always more, more protected there. As I say, these youth, they come under the, um, the authority of development and welfare officials or probation officials, rather than the kind of military or prison run camps that we see in other aspects of, of the pipeline in places like Kenya. So there is this kind of, there is a scale. So I think racial hierarchies are, are very important. Um, and certainly you can, you can sort of trace the, um, the, the depth and the extent of violence and the way that there are more youth sentenced to punishment. There are, there are kind of more floggings. There are more death sentences in, imposed on, on black youth in uh, Kenya. There are more uh, severe and more, you know, uh, capital sentences imposed on um, Arabic rather than Jewish youth uh, in Palestine. Um, and, you know, compare that to what's happening in Ireland, again, there is this different side of scale. So race is a very important dimension um, of this. And it's how I kind of fit this in with how you fit in race, with generation, with gender, with identity, all these things. We do really need much more of a kind of intersectional analysis to understand both youth involve involvement, but also um, clear responses as well. On well, your second question of whether kind of contemporary counterinsurgent theorists and scholars are aware of these um, colonial um, legacies or inheritances, I really don't think very much to extent, you know, aside from the poor ones who have been caught by me in a bar at some point and <laughs> lectured out extensively on this point. Um, there really is this sort of kind of almost a historicism, this kind of loss, this, this idea that they're basically all the contemporary stuff in child soldiering it starts in kind of mid 1980s and there's not a lot of kind of discussion of anything that happens um before this so i think this is a real area where there is this potential really to engage uh to get these kind of you know, contemporary fears to really think about the legacies as i said with things like well no, actually there you have very productive examples of how youth reform rehabilitation de radicalization actually can genuinely work um, and Momumu today is, it has a legacy, it's now 
study here is now one of Kenya's top public schools because it was so successful. So it can it can be done. There are these these spaces for doing this kind of thing and, and sort of looking at, at kind of juvenile terrorists as reclaimable delinquents is actually quite a productive way of of thinking about things um, compared to some of the policies that are put in place today. So uh, thanks for that, Stacey. That was, that was really interesting. And yeah, I, I kind of I got the impression that yeah, there was this sort of amnesia because the, the the more I, I I'm I'm still very new to this this idea of colonial origins of contemporary capitalism. But the more I read it, the more it, it's it's striking how there's such an ignorance of of what was done before. And uh, you know, like someone like Petraeus, for instance, is reading David Galula about Algeria, but is totally unaware of how Galula is reading other earlier French thinkers about the same thing. And that there's this almost like unconscious transmission of of knowledge, but without actually a conscious sort of transference of that. Yeah. Um, but let's, uh, does the audience have any questions um, for, for Dr. Hind? Um, you guys can put them in the chat or raise your hands if you like. <clears throat> All right, well, maybe while we're waiting for them to uh, collect their thoughts a bit, I mean, I, I was wondering, Stacey, like, so with, with this project, it, it, it seems so huge. Are, are, you, are you planning on developing it into a book um, or is it, you think it's gonna be a sort of series of articles instead? I mean, how, how does the book on this look like, basically? Yeah, so um, there's like two answers to that. One is that I am developing, I mean, I am in the middle of writing two grant applications, hence my slightly frazzled appearance. Um, on the African dimensions of that and basically looking um, to a comparative analysis of Anglophone, Francophone and Lusophone territories in Africa between 1940 and 2000. Um, probably going to use Uganda, Angola and Rwanda slash the DRC as our case studies. Um, so that's going to be a book um, and that will kind of do the sort of um, military history slash humanitarian histories angle of this. With this particular project that um, I'm talking about today and this kind of comparative focus on colonial, anti-colonial insurgencies, actually, I think what I want to do with this is to do it much more broadly and do it much more comparatively. And actually, I would love to be able to do um, something like a, a special issue, uh, engaging scholars from these different, uh, working on these different spaces and working on Palestine, working on Ireland, working in Indochina, actually really getting their proper analyses of these rather than my, um, you know, very um, surface skating, <laughs> um, ignorant <laughs> assumptions that I may be making about these conflicts. So I think to do that kind of properly global history, it needs to be done as a team effort and it needs to be done involving uh, as many kind of global South scholars as we can pull in to this. So I'm hoping that maybe um, my work can kind of spark off a few more conversations and kind of pull a few more people. So if anyone's interested, do let me know. Um, Sri Lanka as well, yeah, that would be a fantastic um, example. Uh, there is something that I'm really interested in learning more about, but I just, I don't have the connections or the experience myself. So if I don't want to say it's just people I should talk to, do let me know. Yeah, and um, I know like at the Samarka Howard Center, we're really keen on, on fostering sort of new collaborative projects as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should we should get you Stacey and, and, and get a bunch of people together for a workshop or conference on this sometime. Yeah, that's uh, great. Like, it would be brilliant. Uh, we've got a question here from, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, uh, Jan Nicolas Jave. Um, I'm not sure if you can read this, Stacey, in the, in the Q&A, but I'll just, I'll just read it out um, so that everyone can see. Um, so they're wondering, um, one thing in the history of child soldiering, there is this truism in a quote uh, they believe from the Lord of War, where they point out that the origin of the term infantry is infant. Um, I do not know if it is true, but there seems to be a parallel with what you said about youth being more prone to violent action. Is it really a historic trend of having youth fighting in a regular manner? Um, it would make sense if you look at the question of age of, of conscription. So I guess it's sort of a general question about the, the longer durée history of, of youth fighting in, in wars. Yeah. Um, so this is something that there, there is a sort of a, a debate on within kind of uh, the, the literatures on, on histories of child soldiering. So there's, there's one school that says, 
okay, children youth are involved in most conflicts throughout history that we can see where you look at them, you always will, will end up finding them. And you can go back to the kind of children's crusade, you go through the kind of um, medieval, early modern pages, you go through um, the British Navy and the kind of powder monkeys, you go through um, these kind of classic um, early, late modern god of such a 20th century, <laughs> kind of you know, Prussian, European infantry where you see these kind of large numbers of, of children being recruited in um, from orphanages, all this kind of thing. Um, so there is this kind of long history there um, where children are involved. Um, and we can see them evolve both in these kind of support capacities, but then also particularly once war breaks out, you see them increasingly being pulled into these kind of actual combatant roles um, as well. And we see them particularly, and that's sort of split between the sort of uh, the poorer youth who are pulled into the rank and file, and then the kind of, you know, young teenage officers uh, who may be there um, aged for 14, 15, 16, um, uh, kind of blood high units. So that's one side of the debate that there has always been child uh, involvement uh, in conflicts. The flip side of this debate are the scholars who say, well, okay, yeah, there may have been some children involved in some capacity, but it's not the same as the way that we're seeing it today. It doesn't have, it's not being done to the same extent. It doesn't have the same logics, the same dynamics. And what we're increasingly being seeing is not children being used as, as soldiers, as you know, infantry. Um, what we're seeing are children being deliberately deployed as children in armed forces. So it's a split between what kind of what I was talking about with this dis distinction between the troop fortifiers and the symbolic mobilization of childhood. The assumption that what we're seeing in this kind of um, particularly kind of post-1945 warfare is the increasing deployment and use of children as children rather than just as physically capable violence workers. Um, so that's kind of the debate that's going on in the scholarship um, at the moment. So I hope that answers your question. I mean, um, if other people, please um, collect thoughts and, and type in questions if you had them. I mean, one of the thoughts that, that I had that was very interesting is when you were talking about sort of the evolving sort of um, corpus of international law about the issue of child soldiering and youth soldiering. And um, you, you mentioned sort of um, interventions made by um, formerly colonized nations in these debates. And I was wondering if you could maybe expand on that a bit more. And I was very intrigued when you, you mentioned, I think it was in 1976, Canada was one of the nations that argued for a more expansive category of 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 of, of not uh, considering them illegal combatants and that if they were over 16 and, and saying that um you can have autonomy you can have sort of um political agency and and therefore you you shouldn't be considered just a victim but as a, an active you know agent within this um I, I was just wondering if you know in the canadian example why why that was and and some of maybe the other ways um, these these formerly colonized nations sort of uh, tried to shape international law based on their own experiences of decolonization and anti-colonial resistance. Yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting area. Um, if you look at the evolution of international humanitarian law uh, on child soldiering, as I mentioned, it's the first time it really becomes uh, an issue. It's is in these additional protocols to the Geneva Convention, 1977. Um, it then crops up again uh, in the kind of uh, the United Nations Convention for Child in 1989 to try to expand things. That's not successful. So it then gets pulled up into the kind of optional protocols, Geneva Convention in 2000, which is where they kind of expand it more to this kind of uh, category of anyone under 18. But back in these sort of 1970s and earlier uh, discussions around this, um, it's really interesting the way that I'm, I'm, I'm racking my brain and I can't remember exactly why Canada is responsible. I have to, I have to admit, I'll have to, to go back and check and, and follow that, that up with you. But what we see is a split between a number of nations who wish to expand protections and basically say, well, elsewhere, um, in IHL and the Geneva Protocols, we um, define childhood as anyone under 18. So we should take that for this article as well, say anyone under 18 should not be involved. But this um, contradicts a lot of domestic military recruitment policies for nations like 
Canada and Britain, so there's a lot of resistance to this. So essentially what you get is a split between, on one hand, you have nations who are adopting this kind of 18 as a limit, this kind of much more humanitarian, emerging humanitarian discourse that sees youth as, as innocent, as being protected, and youth as having no place on the battlefield. And this actually involves a number of Latin American countries, uh, you know, and today we see child soldiering as being actually quite a Latin American problem. So there's this kind of weird um, dimension there. Um, and then a few sort of global North nations and sort of uh, Eastern European nations as well, all saying, no, there should be broad protection for youth here. On the other side, you have these nations who are arguing that no, actually 14, 15 seems more appropriate precisely because we have this you know, recent experience of children and youth being able and wanting to be involved um, in these, these conflicts. Um, the three nations that, that make that point most clearly and most, most forcibly are, are Greece, Vietnam, um, and Algeria, actually. Um, Nigeria also makes that point as well, based on its experience of the, the Biafran war, but it's for the anti-colonial, it's, it's Algeria, uh, Vietnam, uh, and Greece. And they all sort of talk about the, the desire for youth to be patriotically active, that they will naturally, um, it is like a product of their good citizenship that youth will want to be involved in these companies and will want to have the capacity. And you cannot deny youth their right and their capacity to protect their family, to protect their nation. And that's the rhetoric that comes up. And it's Algeria in particular that picks up this, this, this rhetoric again and again. And kind of, you know, up and you see it kind of emerging once again in the 1980s and 90s and sort of saying that this, that youth involvement, that youth involvement in these anti-colonial liberation struggles is qualitatively different from the type of involvement we see in later new wars, and that this youth involvement in anti-colonial liberation should be lauded, that it is patriotic, that it is right, that it is part of their duty, and it is a reflection on their, their citizenship, that they, and their, their sort of, their, their agency and their, um, their strength that they want to do this. So there is this kind of distinct sort of legacy, um, legally discursively, um, for a number of, 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 you know, formerly colonized nations that were involved in these struggles where they do see that there is value and they repeatedly argue for the right of, of teenagers to be involved um, in these kind of struggles. Yeah, it, it seemed to me that would tie into sort of um sort of older arguments and debates about how the, the cynical view of international law is that it, it simply serves the powerful and in, in, uh, in limiting the resources and the weapons available to the weak and that, you know, the nations that have just gone through this don't want to tie their hands even more in asymmetric conflicts about, against vastly more superior forces. So, you know, that that, that makes total sense. Yeah. There um, is a, the flip side of that is in that the one nation that holds up a lot of the development of international law is actually on this area is the US. Oh, really? They're the holders. Yeah. And they're the one, of, I think, one of only two nations now that has not signed the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. So the sticking point is always the Americans on this stuff. Interesting. Uh, we have another um, question from uh, Jan Nicola. Um, uh, I'll just read it out. Uh, quote, I also found an interesting parallel in what you said about youth heroes and anti-colonial conflicts. Um, and for instance, heroic figures of the French Revolution, such as Gavroche or Viala. Um, to my knowledge, it's much discussed um, uh, if these figures even really existed, but perhaps the glorification of children heroes in the exemplary revolutions of the 18th century inspired some movements to use young people to create their own symbols uh, later on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so actually, um, David Rosen has written about this quite extensively and he kind of explores this kind of, you know, cultural memories around these, these child heroes in the 18th and 19th century. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, I think, um, but for me, it's a case of, okay, can I, can I tie a, a, a direct linkage between what's happening and those kind of um, discursive constructions um, of, of childhood there and later um, recruitment by anti-colonial groups or by colonial militaries themselves. So I've never seen sort of any direct evidence um, of you know Gavroche or any figures like that being being quoted in any uh, anything, but I think you're right. I think it, it, there is this kind of um, cultural memory 
that that emerges um which could be involved i mean really another thing that i haven't really spoken about today but i think is quite um important if you look at the 1950s and 60s it's actually also a period where the very category of adolescent and teenager is actually emerging so there is this kind of new form of identity um, that is being brought to the fore of this kind of teenage identity and that is very much linked discursively with um, this idea of you know a, a new age a new birth for the nation struggling for independence as well as these new kind of teenagers adolescents who are struggling for their independence and those two things become much more linked so in a way I think almost a kind of closer connection there um, is between this kind of very concept of, of adolescence um, and this kind of youth involvement as well. There is a kind of weird overlap that by the time you get to the 1960s and 70s, there obviously it's a time of youth revolution in Europe as well. So you have in France, you have 1968, you have kind of youth revolution in Germany, places like that. Um, there, there isn't any connection drawn between that and what's happening in the colonies. It's this kind of weird disconnection. Um, and even though there is this kind of recognition of the power of youth revolution in Europe, and that's very present in historical memory and present in historiography, there's this kind of, you know, corresponding gap in the kind of colonial literature is there. So it's, it's an interesting one, and Gavroche is a, is a great figure, but it's, it's not something I've been able to kind of definitively say there is a linkage there yet. But I'll keep looking. Uh, if, if I may prod you with another just question, um, I, I I remember what you you mentioned um, Fano um, briefly, um, and his sort of interview with um, a, a a youth um, soldier, and you know Fano, you know famously he saw the the freedom struggle as a, as a way of you know creating a new national subject, right? And it is through violence and the violence of the liberation that you're going to create the Algerian nation. And I was just wondering, you know imperialism colonialism itself is this paternalistic endeavor where the colonized themselves are infantilized i mean did do, do you know like I can't, I can't remember if he if he does mention this specifically in the text but does he talk about perhaps in a way you know the, the freedom struggle as a way of sort of uh the the infantilized youth asserting their their manhood their adulthood in a way and more specifically do, do you know like did fano have deeper sort of thoughts and reflections on the involvement of algerian youth um, in the uh, in the Algerian War of Independence. Yeah. Um, again, this is something that I have to do a bit more research on. In the final that I've reread for this uh, recently, I, I haven't come across any kind of great detail of this. Um, actually, Derrida is the one who picks it up um, in a bit more detail and, and talks about the kind of the, the figure of the youth and. How it's linked with uh, with um, future futures and independence. Um, I think it's 1965. So yeah, so so Derrida actually does more than than Fanon on this. Uh, as far as I've read thus far, I say I haven't kind of gone through all of Fanon's work, so I wouldn't like to be quoted definitively um, on that. But it was just that kind of it's just that passing discussion um, that really um, uh, I can't remember which one which whose works it is now that really just stood out to me and that that quotation that but they kill children too that that really struck me um from his experience of working with these um on the kind of front lines in the clinics um it's like an odd example um uh, any other questions from the audience if there aren't, then I think um, Stacy has, has definitely earned a break um, after that uh, uh, wonderful talk and, and um, all, all, all the questioning. Um, so I'd like uh, just everyone to, I guess we can't really see you, but let's all just, you know, in spirit uh, and I'll do it physically. Uh, thanks, Stacy, for a wonderful talk. Oh, we do have something in the Q&A. Oh, okay. ah, um, we have, uh, uh, they're asking whether it could be that terrorism is a consequence of foreign policy. Uh, yes, countless evidence that mass murder of civilians too, basically, uh, I guess, does the West reap what it sows and particularly in the ways it, it targets children? Um, 
I'm going to say that I'm a historian. <laughs> and um, so to answer this one, I, I suspect I would need um, more knowledge of the more recent developments um, in Charles Wojcik, particularly around its use in um, Islamic insurgencies, as I suspect that that's what this, this question is really getting at and developments in Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq and various other places like that. Um, there, is, there is work by some scholars like Mia Bloom and uh, a really good recent UN report by um, uh, um, that has explored this that are that issue that question in more detail so it's it's not something that I'm an expert on uh, but yeah and I would say the West does reap what it sows as a, looking long term as a, as a you know colonial and, and global historian I think there is definitely um, a point to be made about the way that that global structures um global inequalities have set up conflicts um have shaped youth experiences uh and in particular the way that globalization shapes youth identities in the sense of youth in more recent years being able to see and compare their lot much more widely than perhaps these these youth that i'm talking about in the 1940s and 50s were able to do that is that was often driving um a lot of more more recent developments um as well, yeah. So I can't really answer that question with a lot of authority um, or skill, I'm afraid. Um, but I would say, look, if you're interested in that, look, Mia Bloom's work on on um, child involvement and terrorism, I think, will will give some of the answers that you're looking for there. Yeah. And just it, it seems to me that the category of uh, you know generational analysis um, is of of course very apt when we think of contemporary counterinsurgency. I mean, just. The, the idea of the the enemy combatant where is so long as you're an adult you're automatically a legitimate target right and um thinking about how categories of youth and and, and uh, play yeah. into that but um i think uh, again uh we've, we've made stacy do enough hard work this evening so thank you again stacy for a brilliant talk um i just uh like to flag up for everyone who's still with us um the so this is the final talk um for the new directions program um of 2021 for, for this term but hopefully you'll all join us um, next uh, term and next year. Um, our first talk is gonna take place on the 26th of January, uh, and it will be delivered by Professor Julie Gottlieb, uh, who's a professor of modern history at Sheffield University. And she's gonna be talking, uh, her paper is gonna be entitled, An Epidemic of Nervous Breakdowns, The Psychological Fallout of the Late uh, Antebellum Britain. So please do join us for that. Um, and thank you again, Stacey, for uh, a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Have a good evening, everyone. Take care.